is the deal which is on the arteries and blood pressure. So we look at the structure and function of blood vessels. So blood vessels are involved in transporting blood and other nutrients such as glucose and amino acids in the bodies. So it goes from arteries to arterioles to capillaries to venules to veins. So the arteries and arterioles transport oxygenated blood, the capillaries and venules, sorry, the venules and the veins transport deoxygenated blood, and the capillaries are involved in gas exchange. So some definitions we need to go through before we continue. Blood flow refers to the movement of blood through a vessel tissue or organ. Blood pressure is the force exerted by blood on the walls of the blood vessels or heart chambers. Resistance is defined as a measure of hindrance or opposition to blood flow through a vessel caused by friction between the blood and the blood vessel, vessel wall. And the formula is flow is equal to pressure gradient divided by resistance. That's how you measure the resistance, blood flow. So the pressure gradient is the difference in pressure between the beginning and end of the vessel. Blood flow from area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So the main determinants of resistance are the viscosity of the blood, the length of the blood vessel and the radius of the blood vessel. A slight change in the radius produces a significant change in blood flow. Key point to understand there. So blood pressure is usually given as two readings, systolic and diastolic. So systolic pressure, otherwise known as systole, measures the pressure in the arteries when the heart beats, when the left ventricle contracts. It is, it is represented by a top number of a blood pressure reading, for example here 120 mmHg. So the right ventricle sends blood to the lung to get oxygen and the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood out of the organs, out to all the organs of the body. Look at diastolic pressure. So diastolic pressure measures the pressure, pressure in the arteries between the heartbeats when the left ventricle relaxes and refills with blood. It is represented by the bottom number of the reading. Say, for instance, 80 mm per Hg. And oxygenated blood returns from the lungs to the heart's chamber. Another thing we need to look at as well is, is mean arterial pressure. So, mean arterial pressure is a measure of the average pressure in a person's arteries during one cardiac cycle. So, it is the perfusion pressure seen by organs of the body, the rate at which blood is delivered to the tissues. A mean arterial pressure of 70 mmHg or above is enough to sustain organs in a healthy person and it is measured by the formula, following formula. Mean arterial pressure is equal to systolic pressure plus 2 times diastolic pressure divided by 3. So the different types of blood vessels vary in slightly but do have, do have varying structures but do have similar general features. They all have a chinica intima, a chinica media and chinica externa. So the chinica intima is the inner layer endothelium, the chinica media is the inner layer smooth muscle elastic connective, connective tissue, and the tuna externa is the outer layer connective fibres. So arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart. The exception of this is a pulmonary artery which carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Arteries have thicker walls than veins to cope with the high pressure of the blood and leaving the hearts, and there are two types of arteries. The elastic artery and the muscular artery. <clears throat> elastic arteries are closer to the heart and larger, and muscular arteries are decreased elastic fibres and increased muscle fibres. The next is arterioles, which are very small arteries that feed into capillaries. They still have the same three layers, tunicas, but the thickness of each is greatly decreased. Arterioles have a small lumen and are very important for slowing the flow of the blood and therefore decreasing the blood pressure. They constrict and dilate to regulate body temperature. The cardiovascular system works with the integumentary system to regulate body temperature in a process known as thermoregulation. So the epidermis is made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. It is avascular and relies on the diffusion of nutrients of capillaries in the dermis. The epidermis has several separate layers of cells and cells that manufacture and store keratin. Keratin is a protein that gives hair, nails and skin their hardness and water resistance. Keratinocytes and outer layer are dead and are continuously shed. These layers, these cells then replace the cells from the lower layers of the skin. So look at the dermis. The dermis can be thought of the core of the integumentary system. 
This this possesses blood and lymph vessels, nerves and structures such as hair follicles and sweat glands. It is made of two layers of connective tissue. The papillary layer is made of two loose connective tissues and connects into the statum for cell of the epidermis and contains fat cells, phagocytic cells, fibroblasts and blood vessels. So look at a family regulation of skin. The integumentary system helps regulate the body temperature. Internal core temperature is 37 degrees, subject to precise regulation. Tissues function best at a relatively constant temperature. The outer body shell temperature can vary between 20 degrees and 40 degrees without damage. So an increase in core temperature, more serious in cooling, results in increased cellular chemical reactions, nerve malfunctions, irreversible protein denaturation. Internal body temperature of 41 degrees causes convulsions and 40, above 41 degrees compatible for life. So a decrease in core temperature slows down cellular reactions and it results in pronounced still prolonged fall in body temperatures which slows metabolism to fetal levels. So the skin cools the body. Sweat glands secrete water to cool the body when it is too warm. When the water evaporates the body cools as body heat dissipates. Arterials in the dermis dilate and become wider basically and blood flow in the capillaries are increased so excess heat in the blood can dissipate to the skin. The muscles are ectopillae around hair follicles so hair lies flat allowing heat to escape. In the sky if you see what happens is too, hot, too, hot, too cold and too hot. So in a too cold situation hair muscles pull hairs on and it hair traps hair and blood flow in the capillaries decreases. Whereas in the too hot scenario hair muscles relax hairs in the Hairs lie flat so heat can escape. Sweat is secreted by sweat glands. This proofs the skin by evaporation and blood flow capillaries increases. The skin prevents cooling of the body. Arterials in the dermis constrict and become narrower and blood flow in the capillaries is decreased to keep blood closer to the vital organs. The muscles are ectopillae around the hair. Follicles constrict to pull hairs on end. Therefore, the erect traps, air, traps air. So look at arterial vasculature, vasodilation. dilation. So here's a normal arterial tone in this diagram on the left hand side. Look at the vasal constriction. This is caused by increased myogenic activity, de increased oxygen, decreased carbon dioxide and other metabolites, increased endophilin, and increased sympathetic stimulation, vasopressin, angiotensin 2. And vasodilation is caused by myogenic activity, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other metabolites, nitric oxide. Sympathetic simulation, histamine release, and heat. And just to mention as well, vasal constriction is also caused by the cold. Another wee nice wee diagram here showing arterial vasal constriction and vasal dilation and what happens on a cold day and a hot day. So, capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, they link arterials and venules. The lumen of capillaries is very small, just wide enough for one red blood cell to pass through. Exchange of gases and other nutrients occurs between the blood and the surrounding cells and fluids. The capillary beds are the site of microcirculation. Blood here can exchange fluids, ions, and oxygen with surrounding tissues. Capillaries are numerous in their number and can contain sphincters to direct blood flow in response to the environment. It is only at the capillary level that fluid exchange can occur. Venues are the smallest veins. Post capillary venues join multiple capillaries exiting from a capillary bed. The walls of venules consist of endothelium, a thin middle layer with a few muscle cells and elastic fibres, plus an outer layer of connective tissue fibres that constitute a very thin tunica externa. Moving on to the veins, these carry deoxygenated blood towards the heart. The pulmonary vein is the exception as it carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. These can also form portals which direct blood from one capillary bed to another from the intestine to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. In comparison with arteries, veins are also thin with large and irregular lumens. Blood pressure is low in the veins, so they have valves to ensure blood flow towards the heart and prevent backflow into capillaries. Veins also act as blood reservoirs. Around 60 to 65% of the body's blood is in the veins at a given time. Veins are also capable of this due to their ability to expand readily to store a high volume of blood even at low pressure. And here you get a wee diagram of the physiological comparison of the artery and the veins. So you can see the artery is much thicker. And the veins are much more thinner, etc. The shape as well. So that's the end of today's video. So 
I hope you enjoyed today, and there'll be many more videos coming. Thank you very much for tuning in, and hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.